Uh, hello, sir. Good evening. Good evening. What, a, what a pleasure and honor to be sitting right no, next to you here. You. No uh, um, uh, we are here at Falcon X. It's one of these amazing incubators in Silicon Valley where um, a lot of youngsters are being guided by none other than Bivu Jagdish, uh, Silicon Valley. And, led and eight others. Eight others. Yeah. Eight others and all are all are uh, successful people mm -hmm. who have built companies from ground up to exit. Mm -hmm. So we are nine of us together. Let's get started with a quick icebreaker round. Uh, let's uh, surprise the audience with some facts about you, which they don't know, and then we'll come to things which they know about you. So, uh, uh, who is uh, B.V. Jagdish? Who is this person? According to you, who is this person? Well, uh, I'm, a, I'm a dreamer, I'm a realist, mm -hmm. and I'm uh, hardworking, mm -hmm. and someone who wants to make a difference mm -hmm. in uh, many uh, areas where mm -hmm. I get involved. Mm -hmm. It could be on the capitalistic side where you are helping entrepreneurs, you are creating companies, mm -hmm. which uh, you're creating jobs, creating mm -hmm. wealth, mm -hmm. or how to create an impact in the society mm -hmm. through either impact companies or through non-profit organizations. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, primarily right now, after having built a bunch of companies, where personally I myself got involved since 1983, mm -hmm. which is when I started my first company, and then I did my second company, Netscaler. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so now I'm primarily focused on helping the next generation of entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, if you ask me you know, how I split my time, mm -hmm. the way I always describe is about 60% of mm -hmm. my time, mm -hmm. I focus on these capitalistic opportunities, mm -hmm. which is creating companies which mm -hmm. are solving problems for customers, mm -hmm. which results in uh, creation of jobs mm -hmm. and, and then creation of wealth. Mm -hmm. And the remaining 40% of my time, I focus on these uh, social impact or nonprofit organizations mm -hmm. where the wealth that is being created mm -hmm. with these next generation of entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. I try to uh, help them to look at these social issues mm -hmm. so that they get involved mm -hmm. in coming back and contributing in some form or the other. And that is essentially what I'm trying to do right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm really enjoying, you know, this part of uh, or this phase of my life. Mm -hmm. Having uh, done companies myself, now I'm like Guiding. working very mm -hmm. closely with the entrepreneurs. Yeah, so based on your answer, I think you are like uh, a I don't know, a, a point of seismic shift. You're know, very powerful people in the society who drive change. I think you're at that point because you're, all, you're from the VC world, but you're changing people to create social impact, not just to make money, but for meaningful work. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, I think that's a great space to be in. And uh, uh, it, also, it also helps, uh, first of all, me and my family, right, to be grounded mm -hmm. and to be connected with reality. Yes of uh, life mm -hmm. and the world mm -hmm. because uh, today or at any point of time uh, the disparity between the haves and the have-nots is so significant yeah. Yeah. Uh, and if, uh, if I spend cycles mm -hmm. on those issues then I get to actually understand mm -hmm. those uh, challenges that the rest of the world is actually facing mm -hmm. and in a way I'm kind of fortunate to know these things much better than most of the people because mm -hmm. I myself actually come yes. from a village, yes. mm -hmm. right? The mm -hmm. BV mm -hmm. that you see, the B is the Bagalur, mm -hmm. which is uh, a, a small village, which is where I was born. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's in the outskirts of Bangalore, although now it's much closer to the city of Bangalore. Mm -hmm. But back when I was growing up, there were no buses wow. and there was no high school. So pretty much after the seventh grade, right, I, we, I had to move out of uh, Bagalur mm -hmm. and pretty much live by myself and with my brothers. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, cooking our own food and uh, all that and visiting my parents. Uh, after 7th grade you did that? After 7th grade, wow, wow. Yeah, starting from 8th grade. Wow. Yeah, so that, that has helped me to mm. really understand mm. the challenges of life. Mm. And coming from a village, it, it helps me to be connected yes. with the realities of life in villages. Yeah, it, you're very grounded, very down to earth. And I keep wondering why, because it's unusual. You have this aura about you, but you also have this approachability about you. Anybody can come up and talk to you, and <laughs> they will not be nervous. But uh, yeah, so I think, um, so tell me a little bit about uh, how this shift was when you moved to Bangalore. You studied in UVC, so this from village to moving, moving to a city. Um, what did it teach you? Yeah, so many things. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm grateful to my parents because uh, the fact that they emphasize on education. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you think of it, right, for a mother to let go yeah. of the children yeah. who are at the age of 10, yeah. to go live in a bigger city, yeah. that's very hard. So you're by, uh, you have a sibling or you're just? I had, my, I had I, initially I stayed with my older brother mm -hmm. and then my younger brother joined as well. Mm -hmm. So the three of us used to stay in a small room oh, in, uh, in Bangalore and then we used to cook our own food because we were so young. Yeah. Uh, we couldn't even stay in any hostel or dormitory or anything. Mm -hmm. And we had to cook our own food and... Why did they decide like that? Why didn't they wait for a few years? So? Because there was no other chance. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the village itself did not have high school. Mm -hmm. So you have to pursue uh, your education beyond the seventh grade. And the only way you could do is by going to the city. And the only way you can live in the city is at that time, right, given we could not yeah, yeah. get into any hostels or anything. And then parents did not feel comfortable putting us in somebody else's house mm -hmm. because, you know, everybody is going through their own challenges and their own issues. Mm -hmm. So the most optimal path for us was to pretty much live independently. Mm -hmm. And the lessons learned during that process, I would say it almost... Shaped. You know, shape my mm -hmm. life and my career because uh, uh, at such a young age, mm -hmm. you, uh, my job actually was to go early in the morning, and my brother used to give me uh, 25 paise, mm -hmm. where my job was to go and buy one vegetable and one curry leaf and <laughs> one lemon. Mm -hmm. So the money was fixed, which mm -hmm. was 25 paise, mm -hmm. and irrespective of what the cost of these things are, I have to get all three of them, <laughs> which means I have to negotiate yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> with mm -hmm. the vendor. Mm -hmm. And at such nice. a young age, nice. right, nice. to really get the maximum yeah. ROI mm -hmm. on your money, mm -hmm. right, was a, was a massive skill. So this you did in Bangalore? Yeah, oh, and gosh. I was only 10 years at that time. Wow. Okay. I was just 10 years. Mm -hmm. And because I came from a village, uh, they had given me like two years of double promotion. Mm -hmm. And when I was uh, in eighth grade, I was only 10 years of age. Mm -hmm. So I ended up, uh, you know, doing these kind of things. And my brother used to cook the food wow. in those early days. Mm -hmm. And then all of us used to go to uh, schools and colleges and things like that. And then come back and again cook our food for the for the evening. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me how you did it when you were 10 year old? Do you remember any instance where you negotiated? <laughs> I know now you do billion dollars, but back then. No, I think, you know, I think basically it's like, number one, you cannot be rude. Yeah. You cannot be upset. Mm -hmm. And Very true. negotiation is always, is always about the, the power, it's the power of the knowledge, right? Power of, power knowledge. of the information. Mm -hmm. So, in, you know, we, I don't know all those things at that time, mm -hmm. but now we all know yeah. the better the negotiator you are when you have more information, right? right? right. Mm -hmm. So in a situation like that, if you actually know right, how much these things cost mm -hmm. in a neighboring store or something, mm -hmm. then you can come back and negotiate. And then make friends with these people, and they also, over a period of time, they, they also know this is what your budget is, <laughs> and they have to fit those things within your budget. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you learned uh, 
So you were Ubering back then, in your own way you were Ubering back. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> All right. So um, that's like due diligence. So you didn't have to go to, did you go, you didn't go to business school, did you? I did not. Okay. I'm, now, but you're I'm, a professor. <laughs> I'm glad actually I did not. <laughs> because I think when you go to these um, business schools. You can make schools, that statement. I, I can never make that statement. <laughs> Why? With my second book, uh, they're trying to do that. They're trying to cut, cut through all the case studies and make templates. But when I say that we are trying to, uh, you know, cut through the case studies of these school, then uh, I cannot say that because I don't have anything to prove like you. <laughs> but you may, I'm glad you're saying it. So yeah, yeah. So I think uh, the the challenge of uh, or the drawbacks of going to a business school is you end up, um, you know, thinking everything in a very streamlined manner. Yeah. And I think entrepreneurship and building a company and really building teams and managing those teams, especially during the early days. Yeah. Perhaps maybe these MBA skills would actually help when the company has scaled mm. beyond certain level. Mm. Uh, that is where more streamlined uh, yeah. process and all those things it's would like be a, needed. Like a factory, yeah. pro, you know, manufacturing process. Exactly. Whereas in uh, early stages of life, like or, uh, of an entrepreneur life, yeah. If you put processes, people would just run away. Yeah, because passion, it's, labor, yeah, love. Yeah. It's, a, it's a passion, it's a problem that you are solving, yeah. and it's how quick you make decisions, yeah. and experimenting with decisions, right? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you know not all decisions are going to go perfect. Yeah. So when you put a process, mm -hmm. then 20 people have to s sign up for this. Yeah. Then there will be you know accountability, and because there's going to be accountability, uh, decision making is going to be delayed, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And those were exactly the drawbacks that entrepreneurship helps to address. Awesome. Right? Because you can actually make decisions much faster mm -hmm. based on uh, your gut feeling, based on the uh, knowledge that you collect from the market and mm -hmm. knowledge that you collect from people that you are working with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. The, if the uh, depth of knowledge, uh, depth in, in whatever you are doing is missing. I mean, take for example, you know, Terranos, yeah, which yeah. is uh, the company, how it grew up by itself, yeah. right? So the founder mm -hmm. knew exactly how to communicate, mm -hmm. right? It was a brilliant idea yeah. and an incredible problem that she was trying to solve and an incredible communicator, yeah. right? because we all, I've heard her speech many times, and I was fascinated with yeah. the way how she was speaking. Yeah. But later on we came to know, after this uh, investigative article that came up from uh, Wall Street Journal, that the crux of what she was doing, she mm -hmm. had no knowledge about that. Wow. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. She had very minimal knowledge, mm. and she just made assumptions that her idea it, somehow is going to work yeah. without really understanding yeah. the depth of, mm -hmm. you know, whether this idea really is doable or not. Yeah, she, it's a leap of faith because she's so passionate about her vision. It's a false leap of faith. False leap of faith. Right? It's a mm -hmm. false leap of faith. Mm -hmm. I mean, anybody can have any uh, assumption and any idea, right? I can actually come up with an idea thinking I'm going to have uh, a rocket right here which is take me to the moon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you make it work? There has to be science behind it, there has to be technology behind it, there has to be execution behind it, yeah. right? You know, all that has to really translate into a meaningful and a viable product. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, your idea is, is not a sustainable idea, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is basically what happened to Theranos, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and we all know, I mean, she's now facing criminal charges because yeah. of misleading the investors, misleading the employees, and misleading everyone else. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, on that thought, uh, what uh, what can change in the current VC uh, startup ecosystem? So, uh, there is this notion that, you know, um, uh, if you build a product and you're trying to reach a market scale, um, then you're trying to push the product too much. Maybe it's not meant to be. A lot of people are now coming to that conclusion. I was just watching a movie, it's called Upstart. It's, it's about three startup people who are trying to uber medical uh, delivery to villages and you know, doctors and nurses and 
um, medical care to villages, for, uh, remote villages, and uh, they start delivering other goods as well. So it's, it's a story of them. And then in that, uh, the VC puts a lot of pr pressure. You know, they, they get somebody from a soft center company, like, you know, it's something like tense. I think they're trying to mimic China there in the movie and uh, this person in, invests 600 crores and they say you know show us the results and these people are under a lot of pressure so why is fear that you know the entrepreneurs have to scale without a reason or is it a wrong fear well because I, I, I know that market size is most important number which you show to a, PC, uh, to a VC when you pitch to a VC correct 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 yeah so I think there are multiple ways to look at you know, what you just said, right? Mm -hmm. So one is from an entrepreneurial perspective. Mm -hmm. It's always the dream of an entrepreneur to create something meaningful and valuable. Yeah. And you need a venture capitalist who sort of helps to realize mm -hmm. that dream into mm -hmm. a reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And during that process, the investor is looking at is this the right idea and is this the right entrepreneur mm -hmm. who is going to help turn my investment mm. into a 10x or a 20x kind of a return, mm -hmm. right? And if I bet on 10, 15 of these ideas, mm -hmm. hopefully two to five of these ideas mm -hmm. will actually turn into 10 to 20, 20x kind of a return. Mm -hmm. So if that does not happen, mm -hmm. then uh, investment into other companies are experimenting mm. in these other uh, these ten companies that failed mm. is not going to happen. And mm. experimentation is very important because you cannot actually look at everything that I touch to become successful. Yeah. It is not going to happen. Mm. Right? I mean, we know the famous quote from Einstein, right? Mm -hmm. Which basically says that right. he says that uh, if you haven't failed, yeah. that means you have not tried. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which is so true, yeah, yeah. right? You have to try and you have to either become successful or you have to fail. Yeah. And nobody can always be successful. Yeah. You will always have a couple of failures, but each failure you learn a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's the norm in which this system has to work. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's not uncommon to see if an idea is clicking, then the venture capitalist would like to see mm. how quickly this idea can reach global markets. Okay. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And if the idea is not clicking, mm. venture capitalist is not stupid to mm. uh, just go spread this this yeah. idea yeah. or, or the okay. product I, I that see, is I not. See. Yeah, I see what you're So saying. there yeah. has to be yeah. a product market fit. So right, and when the market actually adopts mm. the product, mm. right, then you know there is a good marriage yeah. and let's try to make it as big as possible. Yeah, so this is nice. This is a very good perspective. So let's say there are three naive engineers who just graduate. They don't understand the term product market fit. They're just obsessed with the idea and <coughs> um, they build it and they come to you all the way at the end. It's like four years of their life. It's gone wasted. Why can't they come to you early on when they're brainstorming the idea? Why aren't VCs reachable like that to save them those five, four or five years where they're building the wrong prototype, where they don't understand product market fit like you're talking. You're giving a Darwinian spin on that, which is how it should be. But most entrepreneurs don't do that. They try and they fail. Yeah, so there are... I mean, it's not 100% true. So there are entrepreneurs now who uh, take the idea and then they start actually talking to customers, talking to venture capitalists, or, or even investors, angel investors like they us. Yeah, yeah. Just the idea. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, but we, do you lose the that. idea? We see, no, you won't. I mean, if an idea is that easy mm. for someone to pick it up and then, uh, and then lose, mm. then it's not really an idea. Mm -hmm. Right? So it has to be, because a venture capitalist, I'm not here to to take your idea mm. and then give it away to someone else. Why? If you have the idea and if mm. you are good enough, mm. I would rather bet on you. No, see, in sh uh, no, I agree with you. Uh, you're a very good person. <laughs> so your thinking is like that. But you know, if you go to a place like Shenzhen, Shenzhen is like a place where uh, patent really doesn't have a value. Um, it's a very different culture and uh, a lot of case studies say that 
if it's available, they just take it and build something. They don't credit anyone. Uh, the idea is to scale fast and you know don't waste time in patents. So if you look at that, then um, you know. Yeah. No, it's. Uh, uh, it's your idea is taken away by someone and they don't yeah, credit you. See, China, unfortunately, um, has evolved where the copyright yeah. violation, yeah. right, patent violation, yeah. all of these things are well accepted. Mm. And there is no penalty or there is no uh, government law mm. that protects mm. the patent owner or the copyright owner, right? Yeah. So so it, it's always a challenge in China, mm. and that is why a lot of companies, uh, they don't want to go to China early on itself. Yeah. They want to go exactly. when the product exactly. has matured. See, this is good insight. You know, don't go there early. You know, make don't. sure you have a good market cap. Right. And, uh, right. Wow, okay. You have a good branding. Mm. You have a good uh, uh, market penetration, mm -hmm. right? And then you go and you also know how to protect your intellectual property mm -hmm. so that uh, even if they copy, right, they cannot copy and scale mm -hmm. yeah, like that. So th this is fine for um, high margin products like, you know, I used to work for radiation therapy. With the intellectual company. property, correct. Yeah, like a hundred million dollar uh, proton radiation therapy. That's fine. It's very hard to mimic because every part is, you know, you can't copy everything. They have linear accelerators and right. cyclotrons and all. But what about these apps, you know, like Uber or Ola, it's very easily... Copyable. Yeah, yeah. No, maybe not Uber. Uh, uh, Uber has true. its own mathematical model. Maybe it's hard to mimic, but they have their own way, you know, they're O2O, uh, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. You, you... There are many applications that they're Everything's copying. tethered yeah. to the, the phone. The Baidu or yeah. the... Yeah. The, you know, Alibaba, yeah. right? All of these things. What we do with text, they do with voice. Yeah. Because they have the Chinese uh, voice, uh, Correct. A, Correct. you know, NLP but, things. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, idea alone copying is not uncommon. It's yeah, not the, because, uncommon. Because because yeah. you, cannot, you cannot patent an idea. You cannot you, patent You an patent idea. The, the... The execution? Execution or the the techniques or the technologies mm. in translating this idea into reality, mm. that is what is patentable. So which basically, yeah, that's a good insight. Which yeah. basically yeah. Mm. makes it harder right, to, uh, to take the ingredients of the idea yeah. into reality. Mm. And the ingredients is where, mm. uh, you know, if I'm yeah. coming up with an idea yeah. and I'm trying to translate that idea into yeah. a product, yeah. The ingredients of what I do internally mm -hmm. makes it harder for someone else to copy. Okay, great. So, yeah, this is very good insight. Yeah. So, if uh, China, of it. if China basically looks at, you know, even India, for example, right? Mm. They took this Uber Uber model and then they copied that into yeah, Ola. Ola. Right. But how they have done it themselves, who knows, right? There may be some advantages that uh, mm. Uber has that Ola does not have. Yeah or Ola may have some advantages that Uber may not have. Yeah, there's a lot of protectionism also Uber has to face when they go to India. Um, that is also there because they build their local product and they push the outsiders you know, out. So that's another uh, another facet of this uh, copying. But, yeah, but all said and done, India actually did not protect Ola. Huh, they did not. They did not. They allowed both Uber and Ola mm, like to compete that. in the market. Yeah, so that's like the market economy. Yeah, you know, the, the best the market economy. Wins. The consumer yeah. benefited out of it, mm -hmm. both from a functionality perspective and from pricing perspective. Nice, nice. If if you have to start all over again at twenty five, how would you do it differently? And if you are twenty five today, what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you'll say, I don't want to change anything. My life is perfect. <laughs> Yeah, I think the the experiments of entrepreneurship. Uh, first of all, it has to be within you. See, for me, you know, this whole uh, entrepreneurship dream started when I was doing my master's degree mm -hmm. in Bombay. Mm -hmm. Right, that is where this whole spirit of uh, entrepreneurship and one day starting my own company, yeah. basically. Uh, the fire started, and when I came here, it took me, it took me almost like 10, 11 years, right, to kind of uh, put myself in a stable state. In, in Silicon Valley. You mean? In Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. and also the ability to take that risk, mm -hmm. 
and and how wow. you manage the risk. Yeah, as an immigrant, it's very, as an hard. Immigrant, it's very hard. Because if something goes wrong, yeah, I no. cannot be on streets. I'm and nor my family, right? Yeah. Cannot be on streets. But you did it when you came to Bangalore from the village. Yes, <laughs> but so I, I had nothing to lose at that part of time. Yeah, I, but here it's not the nothing same. to lose. Whereas yeah. when you come here, you have a family, you have children. You cannot just put them on streets. Yeah. So there is a little bit of planning that that I had to go through, mm -hmm. and I I kind of uh, planned it in such a way that when I started the company in 1993, I I gave myself time for one year. Mm. that I'm going to try this out mm. and if this is going to click, mm. fine, mm. I'm going to pursue further. If, I, if it did not click, then it's like, hey, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. In fact, my wife was very encouraging to try, asking me to try this out, right? Because this was a burning desire in me yeah. mm -hmm. and she was like, go try it, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Why do you want to curb your uh, this dream that you have? Yeah. So. So one year you try, and if it clicks, fine. If it does not click, go back and start mm -hmm. looking for a job. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, in another year, mm -hmm. I'll be able to find a job. So that means from a financial perspective, I had planned in such a way that for about two years, two years yeah. if I don't have any salary, I can still survive. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you planned for it. So you had a backup plan. Correct. See, that's why that's an entrepreneur, yeah. everybody thinks an entrepreneur more as a risk taker. Yeah. Actually, he's an not, entrepreneur is not just a risk taker, but he's a great risk mitigator. Yes, I like that. It's a very good. Uh, that's what we should teach. Correct. Why are we hyping up all these extreme traits of Correct. risk taking, radical thinking, you know, more organized thinking, Correct. contingency planning? These yeah. are all things we. Every one of our entrepreneurs here, right, is not only taking the risk, but they are also mitigating the risk, yeah. meaning continuously. They're trying to raise whatever money that is required and managing that little cash that they have yeah. to stretch as far as they could mm -hmm. until the product actually gets ready, gets marketable, and in the meantime, they're selling and generating some rev revenues. Mm -hmm. yeah. And nobody is stopping just because there is no VC funding or anything. Mm -hmm. See, that's a true spirit of an entrepreneur. Yeah. Wow, that's nice. So you're encouraging them to fail safely. Correct. Exactly. Correct. <laughs> so it's not only failing, how, how you fail. Yeah. So I am. Before you fail, mm -hmm. you should have given your 200%. Mm. Right? That means, yeah. you know, good, if good. this is the product I wanted to build, mm. okay, build the product. Mm. This is the product I, wa I want to sell to this kind of a market or this kind of a buyer. Okay, did you try selling to that? And mm -hmm. whether it happened or it did not happen. If it mm. did not happen, then can you reposition the product for another buyer, mm -hmm. right? If there is a value in the technology, then if this assumption that you made for this customer to buy and that's not working, mm -hmm. then is there another customer mm -hmm. who's actually willing to buy your product? Mm -hmm. So we have to give all those tries mm -hmm. before you give up. Mm -hmm. So is this taught in MBA or is this something you learned on your... Uh, you think they are currently teaching in the MBA. Where do uh, founders get these skills, these due diligence skills? It's hard to learn these kind of things in the MBA. It's hard to teach these things. Why the don't they teach? Shouldn't they be teaching? Because it's I think, management. I think they they do have these entrepreneurship class. Entrepreneurship class. They it's have, different from but MBA. In, but in entrepreneurship class, no, within MBA, they have these they have entrepreneurship this course. class. I see, I see. My... My personal feeling is entrepreneurship is not something you that teach. you teach. Mm -hmm. It has to be built in. Yeah. So what at the most what they can teach is processes and the risk some, mitigation tools. Some, uh, this methodologies mm -hmm. and case studies mm -hmm. and examples. Because I myself actually teach. You teach your I teach entrepreneurship. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And in Michi all Michigan, right? And here, Santa Clara. Michigan, in Santa Clara University, mm -hmm. and now I teach in a couple of IITs in India. Oh, nice. Uh, Very nice. So when I teach, right, all that I can do is uh, I can take my own examples yeah. and the companies that I've been associated with. Yeah. And I also bring current generation yeah. entrepreneurs yeah. Yeah. and current generation companies exactly. to share their stories. Yeah. Right? And that way, if there is one student in the mm -hmm. class mm -hmm. who has the dream. Mm. 
he now has a little bit of a reality check yeah. to uh, interact with a real entrepreneur, a real person who has built companies, yeah. and how you know you can now uh, take the first step and then proceed to step two, step three, yeah. step four. Like that. Yeah, that's a big boost because that entrepreneur exactly. is probably going to spend next seven or eight years on exactly. that project yeah. and it will change his life. Correct. And so meet the right people early on. Exactly. That's, that's yeah. great. That's why I, I, I tell uh, in my class, right, before the, uh, the class is announced, so you have to tell who this class is for. Mm. So in that, I define very clearly this class is for dreamers or entrepreneurs, you know, who wa want to be entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. or people who want to work in startup companies mm -hmm. because they want to understand how a startup company yeah. actually works, yeah. or people who want to invest in startup companies, mm -hmm. right, because they, they understand, you know, there's no magic that happens. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, there's no magic. <laughs> yeah. Or in general, you know, people who work in big companies mm -hmm. who are thinking of joining startup companies, and yeah. uh, they want to understand how a startup company works. Yeah. So it's actually meant for a spectrum of people, nice. a broad spectrum of people, mm -hmm. right? And I'm not really uh, expecting uh, all the class students to turn into entrepreneurs, yeah. right? All that I'm looking for is that one or two mm -hmm. lights in the class yeah. that could eventually become entrepreneurs. Yeah, this is a very good uh, example of uh, academia industry merger. You know, uh, we think uh, academia is bookish or we segregate it as, you know, not the real world. This is like real world walking into academia and Correct. vice versa. Correct. So, yeah, I, ha I had a lot of questions about uh, studios, incubators, accelerator accelerators and a school for just for VCs. How is one could become VCs? Because when I go to pitch events, a lot of people from, you know, Deloitte, you know, they are uh, like, you know, uh, they are telling other people how to join the VC uh, venture capital, like the Google venture or right, Deloitte right. venture. So, uh, is there like a school for VCs or are you thinking of starting something with your EdTech uh, initiative? You know, like in India, even the street uh, the street vendor is an entrepreneur. You know, with that <laughs> kind right. of reach, they are very entrepreneurial. It's a very good point. Yeah, so are you doing something like that? Because uh, with our book, we... To so teach a VC. To teach how, uh, how to, to be, a, be VC. a VC. That is one. Second thing, the, to bring a... Give some light to these street vendors, you know, what they can do instead of getting beat up by Amazon, what can they do to scale in their own ecosystem. So the reason I said was there was one conference for teaching entrepreneurship skills to middle school uh, and primary school in which they were conducting, Z Network was conducting in Bombay, for which I was going to uh, work with my co-author for building templates for kids. So I'm like, why are you teaching kids? They're like, kids are very entrepreneurial. Mm. They need to understand. So I'm like, are you doing something or is it too radical, you know, don't want to think about it? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's very far-fetched. And I think this VC concept the first, can the be first taught. Concept, first can concept, taught. Yeah. yeah, the first concepts can be taught. Yeah. Because there is a lot of process in the VC, uh, you know, in the VC field, yeah. uh, the structure can be taught. Yeah. But eventually the... The decision making in investing, yeah. right? That is not a one hundred percent structure. Yeah, your your panel in uh, you know I, I, uh, you, India conference, Berkeley India conference, they were saying this is like uh, no one has the answer to this. This panel is going to be a failure. Exactly. How do you know whether this company is going to be unicorn? You Nobody don't know. knows. You don't know. Okay. So what you have to do is you have to bet on this entrepreneur. You have to bet on uh, the team, the team, and, and the, the, the bet on the idea, and. And you, as a venture capitalist, you have to feel, hey, I'm going to help this company. Right? I, I have um, enough skills to help this company to move from point A to point B to point C. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And we have to do everything right. And we don't know the entire dynamics of who else is actually creating a similar product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? You will have no idea at the yeah. time when you're making the investment. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You, we just don't know who yeah. else is actually solving. So the only way you win is if there are multiple ideas and multiple teams working on similar kind of problems that yeah. they're solving, the only way to win is through execution excellence. Yeah, that's what you said is patentable. You know, yeah. that's the thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
one clo- uh, one closing thought i want to share in uh, working for a company in lithuania they bought some templates from our book uh, the reason they bought it was they want to create a society 5.0 an ideal society where a uh, resource allocation is not a problem they they're a small population very homogenous and they want to be like estonia you know ai first and digitally mapped and everything uh, so they want templates uh, from us to connect innovators so we went went through this uh, you know arduous grill we, we still failed uh, how do you connect innovators based it's like uh, we are building something like a dating app but you know uh, can you really connect innovators using traits based on an online profiles like dating people use because you just now said that if many people are working on the same problem uh, why don't you talk to them or work with them or know what they're doing the only way to do it is have a platform where similar ideas or like founder dating uh, can be done uh, so is it possible like do you think it uh, uh, from will will grow will grow investors from india no i think they said the, it's i think the, know, the challenge idea. you know in this i've seen by the way even in non profit organizations yeah. as well yeah uh, so people who are trying to build whether uh, uh, my own company or even a non profit organization mm-hmm. i've actually tried to combine some of these you have yeah guys together and it has worked a couple of times but most of the times it won't work because work. because i think people believe that they have something unique that others don't have that's mm-hmm. number one and number two is they think that they by with them controlling mm-hmm. right the execution aspect of it mm-hmm. they have a better chance to succeed versus mm-hmm. partnering with someone else mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. not knowing the uh, the execution skills of the other person yeah. because you know i mean building a company mm-hmm. only 10% is an idea Ten mm, percent is idea. That's it. Ninety percent is everything. Wow. Execution. Okay. Yeah. Ninety percent is execution. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's uh, it's uh, if someone has a better skills on the execution, yeah. Yeah. building the team. Like search, uh, Google did it better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. then uh, uh, building the team, managing the team, and and uh, you know how you delegate responsibilities, exactly. mm-hmm. right? Because if you are if you very micromanaging kind of thing yeah, yeah. it's very hard to um, translate that into a successful company although there are instances yeah there are instances of certain leaders like steve jobs uh, oh, has, <laughs> has disproved everybody yeah, else yeah, yeah. right and there are a couple other companies that have done but most companies right the that have really gone big and they have really become successful and well respected in the market yeah, like g for microsoft are the ones who on have on. Who yep. delegated who have figured out delegated. how to delegate so we and then build more number of leaders yeah build more number of that's tricky one okay so we have leadership and um, <coughs> personality matching that's as far as we go but uh, we still skeptical because that's a different country different culture leadership skill matching like who submissive who's who's uh, they call it the red personality blue green yellow personality correct so it's from the school of entrepreneurship correct so um uh, it seems it can be gamified so this is all the the ai guys the inspired by we work the lot of whole scores of startups supposed to be very hot uh, this uh, co-working environment correct. this is a co-working correct. environment what correct. if you match the personalities of the startups and the people who come here and yeah. like uh, so that, that's what we're getting it so okay no we i mean as i said right we have we have actually tried especially uh, in situations where a founder requires a co-founder yeah right those are the times where they both agree mm. that this is a good match mm. and this is uh, this is uh, a good way to come together rather than each of us trying to build the same thing mm. and compete in the market mm. so they both have to come together in fact when when i decided to start and when i found my partner mm. uh before we engaged in in uh, you know really like forming a company mm. we sat down for almost 6 months mm. i mean both of us had different jobs mm. and we sat down for almost 6 months and whiteboarded mm. many aspect of the values mm. that we wanted to Oh, how nice. incorporate right most people most people don't do that no. it's a it's a management technique 
you make people write down a right. list of values yeah. and see who scored high on what. Yeah, I mean, we were oh, wow. we were very clear, both of us, right? We made so made do, sure. Do you teach this to the children? I mean, the kids who come to you. <laughs> yeah, my it class. Seems, it seems yeah, it seems like a good thing to do. Yeah, I mean, these are some of the things that I talk about. But how many absorb that, and then how do Like in my case, right, I learned a lot of these things because I used to work for this company called uh, 3Com. 3Com. And the leadership there was absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I meet the CEO quite often these days. Mm -hmm. And every time I meet him, I, I, I try to tell him mm -hmm. that how much actually I learned the leadership skills, mm -hmm. the communication skills, mm -hmm. how to communicate with employees, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of these things. And these were all it's very important. Things, things that we spelled out. Yeah day one, mm -hmm. right, when we started our company, hey, every employee is going to have shares, mm -hmm. right? Wow. Every employee is going to be a part owner of the company. Mm -hmm. every, uh, uh, every employee uh, is entitled to get the corporate information, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So all of these things so that you keep the, the thing tr as transparent as possible. Yeah, this is not happening in Uber or Ola. They're gig, gig workers, they don't get shares. I mean, when you become public, it's kind of hard mm. to disclose. Mm. But when you're a private company, mm. there's a lot of things that you... You can do. You have the uh, rights to actually do it. But when you become public, you cannot. Mm. But still, even as a public company, there are ways to communicate to employees. Awesome. You don't have to communicate the actual numbers. Mm. You don't have to communicate the actual... Um, dollar amount that you won because of this customer. Yeah. But there are ways to actually communicate. Yeah. Or and ways to reward people engaged in, in that. Yeah. And people and recognizing yes, they will people know. who contributed yes, to yes. making the company yeah, happen. Even will, as a big company. Yeah, it comes back hundredfold when you recognize exactly, an employee. Exactly. They feel that is leadership. That's exactly. true leadership. That's what leadership is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think you have a great deal of leadership skills, <laughs> starting with making me comfortable with this interview. <laughs> so I want to go on forever. Yeah, no, no, no problem. We'll do another time. Let's, let's do another time. Okay. <laughs> one, clo uh, one closing thought I want to share. In uh, working for a company in Lithuania, they bought some templates from our book. Uh, the reason they bought it was they want to create a society 5.0 an ideal society where uh, resource allocation is not a problem they, they're a small population very homogeneous and they want to be like Estonia you know AI first and digitally mapped and everything uh, so they want templates uh, from us to connect innovators so we went went through this uh, you know arduous grill we, we still failed uh, how do you connect innovators based it's like uh, we're building something like a dating app but you know uh, can you really connect innovators using traits based on an online profiles like dating people use because you just now said that if many people are working on the same problem uh, why don't you talk to them or work with them or know what they're doing the only way to do it is have a platform where similar ideas or like founder dating uh, can be done uh, so is it possible like do you think it uh, uh, from will will grow will grow investors from india no i think they said it's, i think it's the, the challenge idea. you know in this i've seen by the way, even in non-profit organizations yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, so people who are trying to build, whether uh, uh, my own company or even a non-profit organization, mm -hmm. I've actually tried to combine some of these you have. Yeah, guys together. And it has worked a couple of times, but most of the times it won't work. Because, it won't work. because I think people believe that they have something unique that others don't have. That's mm -hmm. number one. And number two is they think that they, by, by them controlling, mm -hmm. right, the execution aspect of it, mm -hmm. they have a better chance to succeed versus mm -hmm. partnering with someone else mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. not knowing the, uh, the execution skills of the other person. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, building a company, mm -hmm. only 10% is an idea. 10% mm, is idea. That's it. 90% is every it's wow. execution. Okay. Yeah. 90% is execution, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's it's if someone has a better skills on the execution, yeah. Yeah. building the team. Like search, uh, Google did it better. Than yeah, exactly. Else. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. then uh, uh, building the team, managing the team, and and uh, you know how you delegate responsibilities, exactly. mm -hmm. right? Because if you're if you're very micromanaging kind of thing, yeah. Yeah. it's very hard to 
uh, translate that into a successful company, although there are instances, yeah. there are instances of certain leaders like Steve Jobs uh, oh, has, <laughs> has disproved everybody yeah. else, yeah. Yeah. right? And there are a couple other companies that have done, but most companies, right, the, that have really gone big and they have really become successful and well respected in the market. Yeah, like GE, Ford, Microsoft. Are the ones who, on have, on. who yep. have delegated, who have figured out delegated. how to delegate. So we and then build more number of leaders. Yeah, build more number of, that's a tricky one. Okay, so we have leadership and um, <coughs> personality matching, that's as far as we go, but uh, we're still skeptical because that's a different country, different culture. Leadership skill matching, like who's submissive, who's who's, uh, they call it the red personality, blue, green, yellow personality. Correct. So it's from the School of Entrepreneurship. Correct. So um, uh, it seems it can be gamified. So this is all the, the AI guys, the, inspired by WeWork, the lot of whole scores of startups, supposed to be very hot, uh, this uh, co-working environment. Correct. This is a co-working Correct. environment. What Correct. if you match the personalities of the startups and the people who come here? And yeah. Like, uh, so that, that's how we're getting it. So, okay. No, we, I mean, as I said, right, we have, we have actually tried, especially uh, in situations where a founder requires a co-founder. Yeah. Right? Those are the times where they both agree mm. that this is a good match. Mm. And this is, uh, this is uh, a good way to come together rather than each of us trying to build the same thing mm. and compete in the market. Mm. So they both have to come together. In fact, then, when I decided to start and when I found my partner, mm. uh, before we engaged in, in uh, you know, really like forming a company, mm. we sat down for almost six months. Mm. I mean, both of us had different jobs. Mm. And we sat down for almost six months and whiteboarded mm. many aspects of the values mm. that we wanted to Oh, how nice. Incorporate, right? Most, pe company. most people don't do that. No. It's, a, it's a management technique. You make people write down a Correct. list of values yeah. and see who scored high on what. Yeah. I mean, we were, oh, wow. we were very clear, both of us, right? We made, so made do, sure. Do you teach this to the children? I mean, the kids who come to you. <laughs> yeah, my it class. Seems, it seems, yeah, it seems like a good thing to do. Yeah, I mean, these are some of the things that I talk about, but how many absorb that and then how do... Like in my case, I, I learned a lot of these things because I used to work for this company called uh, 3Com. 3Com. And the leadership there was absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I meet the CEO quite often these days. Mm -hmm. And every time I meet him, I, I, I try to tell him mm -hmm. that how much actually I learned the leadership skills, mm -hmm. the communication skills, mm -hmm. how to communicate with employees, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of these things. And these were all things, things that we spelled out. Yeah. Day one, mm. right, when we started our company, hey, every employee is going to have shares, mm. right? Wow. Every employee is going to be a part owner of the company. Mm. Every, uh, uh, every employee uh, is entitled to get the corporate information, mm. right? Mm. So all of these things so that you keep the, the thing tr as transparent as possible. Yeah, this is not happening in Uber or Ola. They're gig, gig workers, they don't get shares. I mean, when you become public, it's kind of hard mm. to disclose. Mm. But when you're a private company, mm. there's a lot of things that you... You can do. You have the rights to actually do it. But when you become public, you cannot. Mm. But still, even as a public company, there are ways to communicate to employees. Okay. You don't have to communicate the actual numbers. Mm. You don't have to communicate the actual... Um, dollar amount that you won because of this customer. Yeah. But there are ways to actually communicate. Yeah. Or and ways to reward people engaged in, in that. Yeah. Content. And people and recognizing yes, they will people know. who contributed yes, to yes. making the company yeah, happen, even will, as a big company. Yeah, it comes back hundredfold when you recognize exactly, an employee. Exactly. They feel that is leadership. That's exactly. true leadership. That's what leadership is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think you have a great deal of leadership skills, <laughs> starting with making me comfortable with <laughs> this interview. So I want to go on forever. Yeah, no, no, no problem. We'll do another time. Let's, let's do another time. This question is, tell me something. Uh, but now you're making such a big... Uh, the bookish knowledge. I have a follow-up thought on that. You don't have to. Uh, depth. Yeah, this is very good. In
let's say there are three naive engineers in Nepal. All right. Uh, if if you have in Bombay, mm -hmm. right? That is. And when I came here, it took. His due diligence skills. It's hard to. Do. House one. <laughs> so let's do another time. <laughs>